Good evening, and welcome to Cosmos and Creation. Let's begin with Psalm number 8. O oh God, my God, how utterly your presence fills all the earth. The stars sing your glory back and forth across the night sky. You have made the wide-eyed children and their wonder to be your great surprise for the learned, for the sophisticated, for the world-weary. When I look up at the vast heavens, at the stars you fashioned with your fingers, and set spinning through endless space and time, I stand in wonder of you. Who are we that you care so for us, that in this steady and loyal universe you chose such a changeable creature? You made us only a little less than yourself. You have crowned us with glory and honor. You have taken all that your hands have made and given it to us, darkness, light, waters, sky, plants and trees and their seed, fish, birds, and beasts. Who are we that you care so much for us? O oh God, my God, how utterly your presence fills all the earth. Uh, welcome. I'm Rob Pond, co-director of Cosmos and Creation, and uh, pleased to see you here tonight. I have a few administrative items to share with you, and then we'll uh, get on with our keynote address. Um, there are two more lectures that follow in this series tomorrow. At 10.30, Dr. Yolanda Witz will give a lecture on ecological metaphysics, Room for a Creator. And then in the afternoon, our member, Dr. Darrell Domning, will give a lecture exploring theology with Charles Darwin. Um, another thing to point out to you is that uh, Dr. Yolanowitz has a series of texts that he's published. One of them, A Third Window, is for sale for you um, out in the lobby. And um, if you wish to buy the book and have it inscribed, then you can come back after the lecture up to the front. And uh, Bob has graciously, graciously agreed to, to uh, inscribe the book for you. Many of you will know the co-founder of Cosmos and Creation, uh, Father James Salmon. Uh, Father James Salmon has been ill for a number of weeks, and uh, for the first time in 33 years, he will not be with us tonight. Uh, recently at commencement, Father Salmon was awarded the Newman Medal, the Loyola Newman Medal, for outstanding contributions to Catholic education, uh, primarily based on his work with Cosmos and Creation. And uh, he was able to attend that and receive that medal, and, and it was a great honor. So, so with that, please let me introduce to you the Dean of Natural and Applied Sciences at Loyola, uh, Dr. Baram Rogani, who will introduce our speaker. Welcome, Dr. Rogani. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Good evening and welcome to this 33rd Cosmos and Creation Conference. Loyola is proud to host and sponsor, in part, this annual conference that examines the intersection of science and faith. I also extend my thanks to Father James Salmon, who created and then shepherded this program for nearly 30 years. We also extend our wishes for Father Salmon's pending 90th birthday. Tonight, we are pleased to have local product, Pro Professor Bob Olanovitz, who was raised and educated in Baltimore, a Poly A student and Hopkins graduate with bachelor's and PhD degrees in chemical engineering. He started an academic career at Catholic University before his engagement in research and analytical studies for the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. Currently, he and his wife have retired to Florida, where he is an associate in the Arthur R. Marshall Laboratory of the Biology Department at the University of Florida. Dr. Lonovitz is an expert in modeling and analyzing, uh, analyzing ecosystems, and his expertise extends to evolution and science and religion. He's the author of A Third Window, as uh, my colleague Dr. Rob Pond referred to that. Um, A Third Window, Natural Life Beyond Newton and Darwin, and also Growth and Development, Ecosystem, Phenomenological, and many scientific publications. He brings us 
a unique perspective on science and religion with a stark contrast to conventional new Darwinian theory of evolution and its extensions. Please give a welcome home to Dr. Robert Ulanowitz. Thank you, Dean Ragoni, for a very kind introduction. It's good to be back in Baltimore, my hometown. And uh, I'd like to start off with thanks to uh, Dr. Darrell Domning and to Father Jim Salmon, both of whom sort of twisted my arm to pull me out of retirement to come here. Uh, those of you who know Father Salmon, please, can, please mention to him that I, I conveyed my gratitude to him with you. I'll try to do the same, in per, uh, not in person, but at least by email. Um, also, my thanks to Dr. Rob Pond and to Dr. Richard Bl uh, Richard Bloom and to Ms. Jane Beatty for their very kind hospitality. It's very gracious of you. Well, it's been a long while since I've been at, at Cosmos and Creation. I think somewhere near the very beginning. And the format has changed and so forth. So I had to go back and read up on the mission. And I was, I was very pleased at some of the things that I read. Uh, one, si one sentence in particular caught my attention. It says, scientists often develop their own cosmology that is in touch with the feel of contemporary science. Uh, I like that because my goal throughout my career has been to develop my own cosmology, and I, and I realize the, the personal nature of that and that the idea that we can develop parallel narratives uh, that aren't necessarily contradictory. And that's why I, I, I entitled my book, the one that's for sale, A Third Window and not The Third Window. So I'll, I'll go on by saying, as, as Dean Ragoni already intimated, my, my perspective on religion and science is quite a bit different, I think you'll find out. Now, most of the discussions on religion and science center about, usually, they're poles apart. You have the physicist at one end, and you have the theologians at the other end. And, you know, they're constantly dialoguing. And then you have people like me, who's an engineer, cum ecologist, somewhere down in the, the foxhole and trenches in between and watching the bullets flying back and forth overhead. And not too many, and occasionally, occasionally you'll get an evolutionary theorist uh, to come and talk and so forth, but uh, nobody seems to want to have an ecologist come and talk to them because ecology is generally regarded as a remote uh, derivative of, uh, of physics, uh, something that's very lawful and sh doesn't really shed that much light on, on the dialogue. So I'm, as I, as I said in my, my talk, I, to, to mix a, a few metaphors from some scripture, I'm a voice crying from the chasm, you know, uh, make, raise the valley, make way straight the, the, the earth, because I, I, I really feel I really feel differently. I guess many of these talks, many, I've been to many talks, obviously, on science and religion. And the impression I'm often given is that there's really no conflict, you know, and that it's just all imaginary. I don't feel that way. I feel that there is a conflict. Um, uh, I think there's goodwill on both sides, but I do think that there is a, uh, a conflict, and that reconciliation will not be, po this is my personal opinion, will not be possible until we change our metaphysical view. And I think this is good not only for science, I think science needs to do it to be able to apprehend life and the nature of life, uh, but also, as I hope to, to talk more tomorrow, afternoon, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, for theology itself. So, uh, why the chasm? Why do I think there's a chasm? Now, I'm not a historian. You have historians here like Dr. Bloom and so forth who feel free to correct me and whatnot. But as I see it, the chasm grew out of, of something that's a little embarrassing. It's uh, somewhat of an overbearing clericalism that characterized the, the 16th and 17th centuries on the continent of Europe and the, uh, the British Isles. Uh, clerics at that time held a power that we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't countenance now. It was literally the power of life and death. You could be uh, excised from the community, you could be extirpated from life, etc., if you propose the wrong ideas. Uh, we see that to some extent today still in the East, uh, uh, but uh, generally in, in, in the West, those days have, 
have passed. But at the time, uh, you had two groups, uh, some of which were believers that were really afraid to, to broach the transcendental and, and life. Uh, you know, famous names like Galileo, Gal, uh, Galilei Galileo, uh, for, or uh, Giordano Bruni, Bruno. Uh, even Newton, Isaac Newton, had to look over his shoulder all the time because he was a closet Aryan. Uh, so, so believers were, 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 were wary not to get too close to life and certainly not the transcendental. But then you had another group that was a great deal more ambitious uh, and resentful, and a few of them were probably not believers, who simply wanted to undercut the pillars of belief that supported the power of the clerics. People like uh, Francis Bacon or Thomas Hobbes, Edmund Ailey or Christopher Wren. Anyway, between these two disparate groups, there was a consensus. And the consensus was we should stay away as far as possible from the living, at least at the time, from the living and the transcendental and not get into, into problems. I contend that that chasm still persists today to an extent. Let's see. So what is the conventional metaphysics? The truth of the matter is right now, we really can't say what it is. There are just too many disparate opinions. But there was a time, a time at the beginning of the 19th century, when there was pretty much unanimity on what, uh, what were the foundations of science. And fortunately, uh, uh, Bruce Weber and David, David DePew in their book, uh, Darwinism Evolving, whom some of you may, were um, able to, to catalog what those, uh, what those issues were. There's closure. By closure is meant only material and mechanical causes are allowable. Okay. Uh, atomism means that you can take a system apart, you can study its parts in detail, and you put it back together, and you know how the system will behave. Then there's reversibility. That's sort of strange. But the truth of the matter is that all the fundamental force laws of physics, and we'll get into them in a little while, are reversible in nature. What does that mean? Well, it means that if, if time appears in the equation and you replace T for time with minus T, the equation doesn't change. That's the mathematical definition of reversibility. But what does it mean, you know, realistically? Well, if you were to take a, a motion picture or a video of two perfectly elastic billiard balls colliding and going away, and if you were to play it backwards, you couldn't tell which was forward and which was backward, okay? Totally reversible in time. Um, determinism, the idea here is that if you can give me a description of the system within, let's say, epsilon, I can give you a prediction of what that system will be like sometime in the future to within delta. So that the idea is all of phenomena is in principle deterministic. And finally, whoops, uh, universality. The idea here is that those laws of physics are universal for all times, all scales, everywhere. Now, this particular metaphysic was quite effective against religion. Essentially, it, you know, it explained the, the motions of the orbs, the spheres, and so forth, uh, without any agent, any, any divine agent pushing them along or moving them along. Uh, divine intervention became unnecessary, and some even began to, to tout that it was impossible. Um, Blaise Pascal, for example, uh, sort of gave an apotheosis of this attitude, uh, and he said that if there were some angel or demon, depending on who tells the story, that knew the position of all particles in the universe and their momentum at the same time, then you could, you could forecast the entire future of the cosmos. Or, conversely, you could retrodict whatever had happened all the way into the past. There's no need for God in this particular picture, except perhaps as a prime mover, the, inter the initial impulse. And those who, who adopted that particular attitude, who happened to include most of our founding fathers here in the United States, uh, were called deists, and their, their religion was deism. 
but it pretty well took God out of the picture. Well, it didn't take a long time for some cracks to appear in the facade. Uh, about four years after Carnot, uh, um, excuse me, after Pascal, uh, Sadie Carnot, excuse me, I, I, I got my Frenchman mixed up, excuse me. Uh, I'll just say Carnot, in about 1824, uh, was an engineer, a French engineer working with, with machines and in mines in France, uh, was able to show that, that processes were, re were irreversible, that uh, uh, you could take a certain amount of energy in coal or whatever your, your or wood or whatever your fuel was, and you could turn it into wood, but you, you always lost some of it as heat that just dissipated away, and you could never reverse that process. This started, this started a real dilemma in physics that lasted for about a half a century, because if you believe in the, quote, Newtonian scheme of things, you had these atomic particles, these small little particles, all of which were behaving according to reversible law. How can all this reversible motion possibly end up in something in a macroscopic larger vision that's irreversible? And that was a major threat to physics. And as I say, it took some, some 50 years uh, to resolve. And we'll talk about that resolution in, in a little while. And then... Because most people tend to think that, well, the Newtonian world view really started to change about 1905 with Einstein and relativity. Uh, and that's true, of course, that was, but that was really the second major challenge. The idea that when you had major velocities, very high velocities, uh, the world didn't seem quite as conservative as it, as it did before. And then, of course, you know, towards the 20s, there was uh, Max Planck, and uh, his, his crowd, Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberg and, and so forth, who developed quantum theory, uh, the idea that nature at its very smallest scale was really discontinuous and to a large degree unpredictable. But, but, closure and atomism by and large survive into today, especially closure. Uh, why? Well, because the force laws are, are, are inviolate. Nobody knows any real violations of the laws of force. And, and what are they? They're the, the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. And I'm not an atomic physicist, so I won't go any further in that direction. But then there's the, the electromagnetic force that, that holds your, your, your elements together. And then there's gravity, of course, that, uh, that it, where, where large bodies uh, attract one another. And that... Uh, uh, these, to many people, are essentially the fundamentals of the universe. Uh, to give you an example, uh, my friend Stuart Kaufman interviewed uh, uh, three of his Nobel laureate friends. He moves in big circles. Uh, Murray Gell-Mann, Steven Weinberg, and David Gross. And he asked them, you know, uh, are, the, are the laws of force enough? And the answer, the consensus was that uh, all causality comes from below, and there's nothing down there but the laws of force. Nothing but the laws of force. So if you have an attitude to like this, it's not a, it's not a surprise then that uh, Carl Sagan, in writing his introduction to Stephen Hawking's uh, Brief History of Time that probably many of you have read, uh, wrote among other things, there's simply nothing left for a creator to do. Even believers like Philip Hefner, a very big name in, in the dialogue between science and religion, in 2000 was asked in an interview for Newsweek magazine, do you believe in miracles? Philip uh, hemmed and hawed a little bit and he says, well, not really, because God just doesn't have enough wiggle room. So the chasm still exists and it still yawns. The idea, the belief is that physicalism will eventually pervade and fill that chasm with a full understanding of the life process. It's not a very balanced dialogue. Uh, I think the ideal for a balanced dialogue was given by uh, a Polish uh, theologian by the name of Karol Wojtyla, whom many of you know as St. John Paul II. He said, science should purify religion of superstition an error and give us a more realistic grasp of God. Religion, for its part, 
should warn science against idolatry and false absolutes. Now, it's a little imbalanced if you think about it. How many times have you heard of, of scientists demythologizing religion? Think about it. How many times have you heard of, of believers critiquing science? So, I wish to add my little pebble to this, this edifice to redress the balance, if you will. I'm going to maintain that the, 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 the ontology of the four force laws is greatly exaggerated. Okay? Not that they are not inviolate, not that they aren't necessary, but they're grossly exaggerated. And in particular, just to telescope where I'm going, they do not determine everything we see. They do, do, they do not determine most of what we see. Okay. And I'm going to draw, I'm going to do this in stages, uh, essentially six stages. I'm going to refer to a rather obscure history of the laws. Uh, I'm going to, I'm an engineer schooled in, in dimensional analysis, and I'm going to talk about the dimensionality of life and physics and the physical laws. I'm going to refer to logic and where there's a really a logical disconnect, to completeness, to this obsession with the laws in abstraction of the uh, the specifics, uh, with respect to contingency that uh, I'm going to argue truly does exist. It's not epistemic, it's not just the, the appearance of chance or contingency, but truly an ontological thing called contingency. And finally, the sufficiency of these four laws to, to, to determine everything in a highly, highly heterogeneous universe. So let's begin with history. Um, this is something that I've come to, to realize rather late in, in, in my career, on only the last couple of years. Uh, if you had asked me about five years ago, uh, what is Newton's second law? Uh, probably like most of you, I would say, oh sure, force equals mass times acceleration. So it came as rather a big shock to me that Newton never said anything like this, never wrote anything like this. As a matter of fact, he argued strenuously against it. Rather, his statement of the second law was that the force is proportional to the change in momentum. That F equals delta P, P being momentum, divided by a constant. He argued against this. Now, mind you, okay, first of all, F equals MA is reversible. It's, it's, you, can, you can look at it going backwards. Whereas when you, when you go from a continuum uh, uh, to a discrete interval, uh, it becomes irreversible. So, so Newton's actual statement of the second law was an irreversible statement. And he actually used algebraic proportions, not algebra, in Principia. Uh, it was actually uh, Leonhard Euler and uh, Gottfried Leibniz uh, from the Berliner Mechanik in from Berlin uh, who, who formulated F equals MA by taking, by taking the difference and moving it into an infinitesimal and finally to you know, to, to the continuum assumption. So I was surprised to know that Newton did not, at least in Principia, make the continuum assumption. He argued against it because he said that it violated Galileo Galileo's laws of co uh, uh, conception of cause and effect. It equated cause and effect. Okay? In his difference form, you had effect and cause, but they're, they're instantaneously the same in the modern uh, conception of the second law. Uh, the person I learned this from is a German by the name of, with the English name of Ed Delian, uh, said that if we were to take Newton's law and move it forward the way we have the Euler formulation, we might not have had need for the exceptional sciences. What are the exceptional sciences? The exceptional sciences are thermodynamics, uh, which Carnot sort of created a need for. Um, uh, um, relativity theory and um, 
and quantum theory, of course, yeah. Um, that he said that, 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 you know, using this irreversible uh, equation and the, the, uh, uh, the discrete formulation of, of it, uh, we could come up with a unified theory. I'm not enough of a ma mathematician to do that, uh, but if any of you have any bright young students, have them give, them a, have them give it a try. Carnot and his depiction of, irre of irreversibility, I think, in popular belief, has been reconciled with the, the laws of physics, the continuous laws of physics. I don't believe that's the case. Uh, and some other people are, are beginning to question that as, as well. As I said before, Carnot's observation put the atomic thesis into jeopardy. And for a half century, physics scrambled to retrieve their Parmenidian uh, view of the world. Parmenides, as you remember, was the, the Greek philosopher who said that the, the, the past and the future is all present, is all, is all contained in the present, that you don't need anything separate. Uh, and that's the way it is, of course, with, with reversible laws. What did, uh, and the, the reconciliation, the purported reconciliation, was by uh, Ludwig, Ludwig von Boltzmann and Josiah Willard Gibbs, Josiah Willard Gibbs in the, um, the, the latter part of the 19th century, about 65 to 85 or something like that. And what did they do? Okay, they took an extremely simple system, a perfect gas. A perfect gas, as many of you are aware, are, are, consists of molecules that have no dimensions, they're points, and they don't interact with one another at all. Uh, so it's, it's very hypothetical. Um, he made some rather unrealistic assumptions called the ergodic hypothesis, strange sounding name. And what that was is that essentially uh, uh, temporal series can be, or can be represented by, by spatial conglomerates and vice versa. And that's something that, that if, you're, if your tokens, if the little things in your system happen to interact, you can't say. Um, and he imported stochasticity. Actually, one of his assumptions was that the, the gas to begin was, with was randomly uh, uh, distributed. Um, and he was able, uh, Boltzmann was able to come up with a, with a function that behaved in, a, in an irreversible way. It was always increasing. Uh, it's Boltzmann's entropy, later has the same form as, formally as, as Shannon's entropy. Everybody rejoiced, the Parmenidian universe was, was saved, and abruptly the controversy came to an end. Okay, now notice how different that is from us living here in the 21st century, even the 20th century, uh, when we had uh, Karl Popper and the, the Wiener Kreis, the Vienna Circle, uh, who came up with the necessity for falsification. The idea here is that to be really a legitimate theory in science, your theory has to be falsifiable, and you have to push at it and try to falsify it all the time. Not too many people do that, to be honest, but others try to do it to, to, to other people's theory. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very much... Uh, a part of, of, of science. Um, and then, but look what happened here. You had uh, a particular controversy and you saw that it could be solved in one very, very extremely narrow set of conditions and therefore you said, okay, it's good everywhere. Just the total inverse of Popper's falsification. Okay, let's move on to dimensions. Equations must be dimensionally consistent. What does that mean? It means that, that the units that you express your quantity on one side of the equation have to be the same as the units on the other side. Furthermore, if you have terms uh, you know, that are added and so forth, each of those terms has to have exactly the same units. Being brought up as an engineer, it was a major check on our logic to make sure that our units always worked out. Um, if they don't work out, then you're comparing apples with oranges, and you just can't create the, the equation. Now, that's strictly not true, um, and I don't really want to get in too much of an aside, because you have many equations where, where you have, say, 
uh, voltage and current, and you relate, and they don't have the same dimensions, you relate them to something that has the dimensions of voltage over current or resistance or ohms, okay? Uh, you can do that, you can do that for things for physical variables that are what's called homogeneous. Uh, you know, there, there's heat, heat is heat is heat, mass is mass is mass, you don't distinguish. Um, you can't do that in very highly heterogeneous systems. That's just a, a little aside for those of you in saying, what are you talking about? Um, now, going on to about 1915, I think it is, if you have reversible, reversible equations, a lady by the name of uh, Emily Noethe, uh, I think she was an Austrian uh, mathematician, physicist. Well, anyway, if, unless I stand corrected. Uh, was able to show uh, in the early 20th century that if you have a, an, a reversible law, you can always define a potential that is conserved. And of course, we know some of those potentials. They're called energy, they're called momenta, they're called mass. Okay, and they, you don't create them or, uh, or destroy them. Um, so that really, in essence, if you will, although time appears in these laws, time just signifies motion, not real change. You're dealing with what, what virtually are platonic essences. Okay? Time, however, is integral to life. Life is a process, a process being a transition from one state to the next over an identifiable period of time to the next to the next. It's irreversible, as we all know, death and taxes. Life is a process, it's a verb. It's not a noun. As Karl Popper said, we are not things. We are like flames or networks of biochemistry and, 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 and physical substances. I love that since I did my own entire career in, in networks. An early proponent of all of this before Popper was Tillard de Chardin. You might think it's appropriate to, to mention in this particular forum. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, Divine Milieu, 1959, but he described life as process. For me personally, I was convinced that life was process in talking with, a, with an Italian friend of mine, Enzo Tietzi. Uh, Enzo was a thermodynamicist. He studied under Ilya Prigogin. Uh, he happened to own an estate in Tuscany near Siena. He had popes in his lineage. He was a scion of popes and so forth. And he had this beautiful, beautiful uh, 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 estate, and he grew grapes and olives. The problem is, there were a lot of deer that came around, ate the grapes, and ate the olives. And Enzo got a little upset. He was just tired of it. You know. So he got mad. He grabbed his gun, and he ran out, you know, and he, boom, he killed the deer. He looked down on it and said, huh, and wept, you know. But then he began to think, because he's a thermodynamicist, and he's worked under Prigogine. He says, What's different about this deer than the deer 90 seconds ago? It has the same mass. It has the same form, except for the little hole. It has the same bound energy, the same genomes, the same molecular configurations are all still there, but the deer is dead. What is missing? The answer is the configuration of processes that vitiated the deer, that, 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 that showed us that the deer was actually alive. Well, those things that I mentioned, mass, form, bound, they're the real numerary, they're the real currency, if you will, of modern biology. But they don't get to the, the, the kernel of life, if you will. Um, I understand that uh, Francis Fran Francisco Ayala spoke here at Cosmos Creation a while back. I was privileged to be at the uh, 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 conference in the Gregorian, big Jesuit thing, uh, the Pontifical Gregorian back in 2009 when, when uh, Francisco made this statement. He says that evolution is nothing more than matter moving according to universal laws. You know, I almost jumped out of my seat. Um, because, because 
life and process has time, active time. It actually has the dimensions of one over time or rate. We measure the rate of a particular process. Whereas matter moving according to, to uh, universal laws can all be computed backward into these timeless things, these timeless potentials. So time is virtually missing. And you're trying to compare apples with oranges. They're dimensionally inconsistent. OK, let's move on to logic. Walter Elsasser, who ended his career here at Johns Hopkins in the physics department. I had the honor of, of conducting him on a tour one time of my laboratory in Solomon's. It was, it was a great time. It really was, him and his wife. Anyway, um, Elsasser was, was, was asking himself as a physicist, how do biological systems, he became interested in biosystems late in his life, how do biological systems differ fundamentally from physical systems? And uh, remember again, process is a transition among heterogeneous kinds. It's, it's, the, it's the transition from one kind to the next to the next. Laws deal with operations on homogeneous sets. Homogeneous sets means things that you can't distinguish. Mass, okay, we don't know, uh, we can't distinguish uh, uh, a 55 kilogram lump of coal from this wonderful Dr. Pond sitting here. If we're, you know, if we're doing our calculations for, uh, for orbits and spacecraft and whatnot. Um, and, uh, Whitehead and Russell, back in 1913, quite a while ago, said that the four laws of physics could all be shown commensurate logically with operations on sets, operations on homogeneous sets. Okay? Once you start working with operations of heterogeneous groups, because a set has to be homogeneous, it has to have the same tokens. Once you start working with, with uh, operations of heterogeneous groups, all bets are off. Okay, and, and Elsasser actually said, nothing like the laws of physics can be derived for biology. He didn't say that you can't derive laws for biology, but just nothing that looked like these laws you're going to find in biology. I, I made up a little uh, heuristic example, I think, of, of this. And bear with me, this is not a demonstration, it's not a proof or anything like that. It's just something to give you a feel for for what they were talking about. Suppose I have uh, a couple of sets. Uh, I define my sets all to be five uh, tokens of integers, you know, five ones, five twos, five threes, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all homogeneous. They're all the same. And suppose I take uh, uh, one set of twos, five twos, and, and do something with a perform some operation on another set of four. Say, for example, I, I, I multiply uh, various pairs together, the result will be another homogeneous set, if you will, of eights. The same thing, now, now suppose I, I define my groupings differently. Suppose my first group is 1 through 5, my second group 6 through 10, my third 11 through 15, and so forth. Suppose I do the same thing with them. Okay, here's 1 through 5, and here's 1 through 5, and I do the exactly the same thing I did before. What happens is, that the results scatter out over other categories. And this is just sort of to give you a feel of the, 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 the indeterminacy, if you will, that, you, that, that begins to pop up when you start to deal with heterogeneous systems. So, uh, so there will be no such laws for biology. Okay, the third category is completeness. Universal laws can only be expressed in terms of universal variables, okay? I've been talking about them already. Mass is mass is mass. It doesn't matter what form it has. Energy, likewise. It can be heat. It can be chemical potential energy. It can be kinetic energy. You name it. Uh, charge, temperature. These are what Gregory Bateson calls pleroma. <laughs> and he, dis he differentiates pleroma from creatura but that's another matter, uh, which are the heterogeneous systems where difference makes a difference. But every real problem has its particulars. You can't just talk about the laws in abstraction from the particulars. 
it's not a complete statement. You always have to make what is called the boundary statement, or sometimes called the boundary conditions. Now, for those of you who aren't into, into physics, what would an example be? Suppose I want to, to, to calculate the trajectory of a cannonball. Okay, the appropriate law there would be Newton's second law in the presence of gravity. Um, but that's not enough to tell me where the cannonball is going. I have to know the specifics of the problem. I have to know the coordinates of the cannon, where the cannon is located. I have to know what the muzzle velocity is, how much energy I've got coming out. And I've got to know the angle of the cannon with respect to the Earth. I probably have to know a couple of other things, uh, but that's at least the minimum. In other words, you, no problem is fully specified without both the laws and the accompanying specifics or boundary value problem. It's a requisite part. Now, if those boundary conditions can be stated simply and in closed form, you'll have a determinate system. Okay, we can calculate the cannonball trajectory. But, and this is very important, our laws are universal. Okay? They, have to depend, they have to be valid anywhere, every time, for any boundary condition, any boundary condition. If you can find boundary conditions for, for these, these, these universal variables, if you can find boundary conditions for which the law does not apply, then it's not universal by tautology. Okay? So it's always up, up to, the, to the person framing the problem to, uh, uh, to choose the boundary statement. And intentionality, incidentally, is not forbidden. So, just like, just like uh, Boltzmann, we could, if we wanted to, state a boundary condition that was blind chance, just, just random events, and, and, and apply them to, to, uh, to the laws of physics. And what we would get out looks pretty much like blind chance out the other end. Um, and that's, as I say, that's how Boltzmann introduced uh, statistical mechanics. The reversible laws are pretty much indifferent to what drives them. Drive is a particularly meaning-laden word here because we generally talk about the boundary conditions driving the laws. The laws constrain whatever is given in the, in the boundary condition. If you have clear boundary conditions, you get clear determinate results. If you have messy boundary conditions, you're going to get untidy results. It's very analogous to, you know, the computer dictum, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but that's not a problem if indeed you're just dealing with blind chance, because as we all know, we have methods of dealing with random blind chance. It's called probability theory, probability and statistics. The problem is that probability and statistics can only be applied to chance events that are simple, that are directionless, that are homogeneous, and are repeatable. Those are four rather strong conditions. And of course, we know all sorts of, uh, of situations where, where, where that's true. But uh, uh, I would maintain, and Walter Elsasser would also maintain, that only a minuscule fraction of all chance events represent blind chance. There's an awful lot of what I would prefer to call contingency out there that is simply not blind. And it's not blind in both directions, okay? Uh, Elsasser, for example, said, in biology, as heterogeneous as it is, almost all your, all your contingent events are unique. Okay, they've never happened before, and they will never happen again by chance in the rest of, you know, for the rest of the universe. That sounds like a pretty strong statement, but hey, this fellow's a physicist. He knew what he was talking about. Uh, uh, how is this possible in such an enormous, enormous universe that we have? Well, let's see. Okay. Actually, that's wrong. I should have changed that. Uh, physicists now agree that they're pretty much close to, to, to 10 to the 81st elementary uh, uh, elementary simple particles in the entire universe. Uh, there may be more now. We have you know, the Higgs boson and so forth, but it's not going to be a whole lot. That's one with 80, 80, 81 or 85 zeros after it, a really, really big number. Uh, how old is the universe since the Big Bang? Well, we estimated that it's about 20, 10 to the 25th nanoseconds 
old. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. It's the scale on which most uh, atomic and molecular uh, events occur. Okay? So Els asks a reason that the, 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 uh, possible, the maximum possible outer limit on simple events that could have occurred in this whole big universe, you can get by multiplying the two together. It comes out to, actually should be 10 to the 106, sorry about that, I, I grabbed an old slide. And it, anyway, a very large number. Elsasser says that anything bigger than this uh, simply doesn't have physical reality in our universe, unless you believe in multiverses and so forth. Anything bigger than this just doesn't pertain to our universe. It's beyond the physical, okay? It's the metaphysical. Anything smaller than 10 to the minus 150, likewise, can pretty much be neglected. Uh, so that uh, if you have a system with 80, let's say, okay, the question is how many how many distinguishable tokens do you need before the combina random combination of them you can pretty well say is unique? And the answer is about 75. It's not billions. It's not Avogadro's numbers. It's not billions or millions. It's 75. The reason being that the combinations is roughly scales as, as n factorial, and 75 factorial is 10 to the 106. So that if you have uh, 80 distinguishable tokens. Now, as an ecologist, we deal with organisms that are easily identified. We're dealing with hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands of organisms all the time. Uh, uh, if you have 80 of them, uh, they will not reoccur by chance for about a thousand times the age of the universe. They are unique. I call such chance radical chance, and it's something even more radical than blind chance. Now, on the other side, so, so we have blind chance here and radical events that I've just talked about. On the other side, going up towards well-behaved things or determinism, we have conditional chance. That's something like uh, uh, loaded dice, okay, where, you know, they're shaved or, or imbalanced or something like that so that certain numbers appear more than others. So there's a conditional probability at play here. Or in ecology, um, we find that, the, the, uh, uh, that a predator will eat prey in a different proportion than it encounters them randomly in the environment. So there's a skewing there. It's conditional. That's uh, something that's a little bit more constrained than blind chance. Uh, Karl Popper talked about propensities because he saw, he saw the laws of nature as being propensities, not ontological absolute laws. Uh, propensities are when one thing happens almost all the time, but every once in a while something else does. If A, then B. If A, then B. If A, then B. If A, then B. If A, then C. If A, then B. If A, then B. If A, then D. The idea here is that most of the time one result always comes up. You know, an example of that would be um, immigrants coming to the United States during the, the 19th, early 20th century. Uh, censuses show that, that about 90% of the couples that are married of these immigrant groups will marry within their immigrant group, only 10%. That's a propensity. Um, so, that, so that what we have here, what we have here is essentially uh, a, a spectrum of contingencies. Okay? It goes all the way from really radical events all the way up to determinism. This whole idea of Monod, Jacques Monod, that we have chance and necessity, this dichotomy, is just, it's, it just doesn't hold water. Okay? It's, it's, it's an exaggeration, if you will. You can draw your boundary conditions anywhere along that spectrum. And what you get out as a result will pretty much look the same, you know, pretty close to the same, to the same way. They all can serve as boundary conditions, even intentionalities. Somebody had to fire the cannon. Okay? So, the idea here is that if you cannot specify your boundary conditions in closed form, that means, you know, in, 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 in a form that's readily presentable, you can't solve the problem. 
The problem is insoluble. You cannot predict. You may say that, okay, the laws are not violated. And we can believe that too, but it doesn't make any difference because it's not predictable. Simply not predictable. Then we've got the problem of the combinatorics among the heterogeneous, which we've just talked about already. Mind you, how many fundamental universal laws of physics do we have? Well, we have the four, the four force laws. We have uh, the first and second law of thermodynamics. You can include the, the third if you want, but it's, it's really a different animal. Anyway, you've got a few of them. You can count them on your fingers. Let's say there's six of them, okay? Uh, the combinations among them are going to be on the order of hundreds. Six factorial is 720. Well, that's an awful lot of combination, combinations to try to pin things down. But think about heterogeneous systems, biological systems, where heterogeneity really reigns. If you have something with only moderate heterogeneity, with maybe uh, 35 uh, particular tokens, uh, that's going to give rise to 10 to the 40th power, one with 40 zeros possible combinations. So if you divide that 10 to the 40th by 760, you're going to have quadrillions, trillions, billions, millions attached to each of the combinations of the force law. Now, obviously, you know, there are certain other auxiliary conditions that will narrow that down. But the bottom line is that you often have a multiplicity of possibilities of heterogeneous systems that can satisfy all those laws, all those combinations of laws, exactly. The laws can't discriminate among them, between them. It's not that they're violated. They simply are incapable of discriminating. I mean, just, just look at very simple things like uh, dextrose and levulose. Uh, uh, you know, they're almost the same thing. They're simple sugars. One's right-handed and one looks just the other left-handed. And it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to tease them out. Just think of it when you get to macromolecules with, uh, uh, you know, 40, 40 polymer units and so forth in them. Um, it gets, it gets pretty, pretty messy. So the possibilities rapidly grow unmanageable. Um, Stuart Kaufman, I think, makes good use of this, and he describes what, other, what evolutionary theorists call exaptations, E-X-A-P-T-I-O-N-S. That's the idea that you have a structure that evolves for a particular function in a particular context. Uh, the classical example of this is the, uh, uh, the swim bladder and fix, okay? Uh, if you go back in, in paleontological history, you'll find, um, uh, you'll find these cavities in fish way back when, when there wasn't a whole lot of oxygen in the water and so forth, and fish were about to come out on land. Some of them did come out on land, and that cavity became their lungs. So this is a proto-lung. But some of them, some of them survived in... Uh, in, in, in oxygen-rich waters and use that same cavity for a different function, for a different purpose, to maintain or to change their position in the water column. It became a swim bladder that could expand or contract to regulate, and that gave them an evolutionary advantage and whatnot. Now, Kaufman asks, how are you going to, uh, how are you going to predict what an exaptation will be? Okay? You can, you know, here you can say, okay, maybe you can come up with a couple hundred, but, but there, there, are other, there are other illustrations where the possibilities just go on and on and on, and they're virtually, virtually uh, limitless. He likes, he likes the uses of a screwdriver. You know, how many, how, many, how many uses of a screwdriver can you find? If we were to poll everybody, we could come up with several hundred of them uh, right here, but the idea is that they are technically limitless. So that... Uh, Exaptations and, and evolutionary theory are, are, are in principle, in principle, non-predictable. Okay, well, that's a pretty grim thing, and I don't want to, I don't want to send you home tonight, uh, you know, worried about you know whether the world's going to fall apart tomorrow. Obviously, the sun will rise, and not only that, we look out into the world and we see all this wondrous biological order. You know, where did that come from, if not the laws of physics, huh? Um, and I'm not going to gainsay the laws of physics. They're, they're certainly outstanding contributions. Everybody recognizes that's that. And they are necessary, and they are inviolate. But they only support and constrain. They do not determine. What does determine? 
Okay. I've identified life as process. And processes can interact with other processes. They can share the same stages and so forth. Um, in particular, certain configurations of processes can be quite stable. So that what we want to do is search among what I would call an ecology of processes to look for configurations that are reasonably stable. Gregory Bateson, whom I've mentioned before, gave us a clue as to where to look. He said, in principle then, a causal circuit will generate a non-random response to a random event. Okay, you put a, that's different from something that's truly irreversible. You put a, a random event, random events in and you get non-random events out. I'm just going to cut directly to the chase and look at one particular causal circuit that I call autocatalysis. Auto meaning self, catalysis meaning speeding up. And, uh, or self-quickening. So that we have three processes. Process A facilitates process B. Process B facilitates C. And process C in turn facilitates A so that A gets self-facilitated, autocatalysis. You can think of this if you, if you, don't, want to like, if you don't like autocatalysis. It's, it's indirect mutualism, okay? Um, can you give an example of that, you asked me? Okay. Uh, Bladderworts, utricularia species. You find them in the ponds even up here in Maryland, but you find them especially in the karst lakes of Florida. Uh, they're they're large, they're feathery, they're feathery, feathery leaved aquatic plants. You know, they grow about to half a meter up, you know, off the bottom. And they have these little uh, uh, these little utricles on the ends of them. These little sometimes they're black, sometimes they're clear, and so forth. If we take a close look, close up look at one, what we discover is that they're hollow, and that there are hairs on one end, and that you have these little invertebrates, these microinvertebrates, tenth of a millimeter, running around, you know, water fleas or something like that, and they occasionally will touch one of these hairs. If that happens. The, the, the vacuole, the, the utricle, opens up and there's a negative osmotic pressure and the organism is sucked into the, to the thing. It then closes, just like the Venus flytrap that you're probably all, all familiar with, and, and it eventually feeds the plant. It doesn't truly digest it, but it does feed the plant. Uh, and I would say that this actually uh, constitutes uh, an ABC uh, mutual beneficence. Uh, the key here is that the utricularia always has a film of algae uh, on its surface that grows along all of the, the stems, the leaves, and the utricles always have this little slime of algae growing on it. It's usually reasonably, reasonably clear and so forth. And that's neat food for, for the little heterotropes. They, they love it, and in, 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 in nutrient-poor areas, uh, this algae grows much better on a surface than it does in the, in the middle of the water, so that the algae will grow, uh, the, 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 the little bugs will come, and they'll eat the algae, and boop, all of a sudden, they feed the utricularia. So the idea is that the utricularia gives area for the, for the paraphyte, and the paraphyte gives food for the heterotrophs, and the heterotrophs give food to the utricularia. Um, now, this autocatalysis, when it interacts with contingencies, gives rise to rather non-mechanical behavior. One of the things it does that, that you hear very, very little about is it creates selection. Let's look here. Uh, suppose there's a change in B. If that change in B makes it more sensitive to A or a better catalyst of C, then it's going to get re be rewarded. It's going to get more from, B, from A it's around the loop. Conversely, if the change in B makes it less sensitive to A or a poorer catalyst of C, it's going to get less from A. There'll be a reward against it. Notice the asymmetry, very important, the asymmetry, uh, and that... Uh, uh, and that the asymmetry always favors greater autocatalysis. There is a preferred direction dynamically in this system, and it's always in the direction of greater 
autocatalysis. So that autocatalysis essentially is self-advancing. It's a positive feedback loop so that it, it, uh, it, uh, it, it tends to, 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 to incite growth. And you don't hear too much about positive feedback in the engineering community because the simple systems that we engineers work with, most of them are linear, positive feedback is always uh, destabilizing. Uh, it just, you know, it goes off to infinity and, and something happens. But in a very highly dissipative environment like biology, you know, you get 10% efficiencies in trophic transfers in biology oftentimes. It's the only thing vigorous enough to maintain its structure and activity in a highly dissipative environment. So we see, uh, you yeah, know, the, the idea here is that, is that uh, uh, autocatalysis is both self-advancing and self-preserving. Okay, if there's, it, it mitigates against uh, those, those, those bad changes in B, okay? Uh, you know, if there's a wound and so forth, it tends to heal the wound, if you will. Um, it inflates probabilities along the pathways, okay? In other words, as these, this particular construct may be in a big network of lots of others, and I'll show you some in a little while, uh, and because they're participating in all catalysis, the probability f from A to B is going to be bigger than the probability of some X to Y out here. It inflates those probabilities, and it gives you, to the point that they become rather large, and it gives you what Bernard Lonigan, another Jesuit, calls emergent probabilities. Now, it does something else. I've drawn this without, its, without the resources. You know, there's no resources coming into B, C, or A, but actually, in reality, material and energy have to flow into each of these. Suppose there's a change in B that helps bring more into B if that's, and, and allows it to, to act at a faster rate. That's going to be rewarded, okay? Conversely, if, if, if it deprecates its ability to bring stuff in. But that's true not only for B, that's true for C and for A. The idea is that when you have an orbit, I call it, you know, an orbit of autocatalysis, uh, there's, the, over time, there's a tendency to draw ever more material and energy into that orbit so that you get what, uh, what Isaac Newton coined the term for centripetality. Centripetality, I maintain, is one of the unsung attributes of all life. Go out there and look at, look at attributes of life. They're listed all over the place and Google them and so forth. I'll bet you you won't find any of them that, that mention centripetality, and yet you see it all over the place. You know, we're always hungry and bringing things. But, but you can even go out ecologically, for example, in the, in the, uh, the open uh, tropical seas that are pretty much deserts, okay? And then you'll have this coral reef in a tropical sea, and it's a major oasis. Very little uh, uh, nutrients and energy out in the, the, the water as a whole, but it's concentrated within very strong cycling, autocatalytic cycling within the coral reefs. So, centripetality. Centripetality, of course, ratchets up growth. Now, you're going to hear more about Darwin tomorrow, but, and you, Dr. Domnin can correct me if I'm wrong here now, but, but my impression of Darwin's original narrative is that it was pretty much a balanced dialectic between growth and elimination. The idea is that you had this, uh, uh, this Malthusian type growth uh, that proposed, if you will, and then you had natural selection that eliminated. Uh, or as my friend Stan Salty says, uh, 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 centripetality proposes and natural selection disposes. Um, the problem is that the growth side, and here again, some of you are evolutionary theorists and can, can, can object to this, but the growth side is pretty well atrophied from our, from our narrative. Our neo-Darwinian narrative talks almost entirely about elimination, not about growth. It's an imbalanced narrative uh, in comparison to what, what Darwin first proposed. Uh, so that centripetality, as I said, is missing from all of these lists, with a few exceptions with a few exceptions. One of them 
And I've never his name already. It was Bertrand Russell. You all know Bertrand Russell. He was a critic of Christianity, unfortunately. But uh, Bertrand Russell was very aware of centripetality, and he and Kenneth then be called this, a physical chemist, called this chemical imperialism. Okay, the idea, because he had, he had the right notion, you know, he's Brit, uh, uh, that, that, that imperial action brings material, you know, concentrates centripetally from all of the colonies. He called it chemical imperialism. And, and here's the cool thing, he said that it is the drive behind all of evolution. Okay? Not competition. Chemical imperialism is the drive behind all of evolution. Okay, think about this. If you've got an autocatalytic set, an autocatalytic system, and you have another autocatalytic system, and they're both drawing, and you put them in a finite field of resources, eventually they're going to grow such that they will compete for the same resources. Competition becomes inevitable. Competition is induced by the autocatalysis. And what does autocatalysis depend upon? It depends on mutuality at the next level down. Okay? So that mutualism is primary, competition is secondary and derivative by comparison. Okay? Those of you who are into ethics might see a little story here developing. Because, you know, uh, the whole evolutionary narrative occurred in the United Kingdom, very big on competition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you have these, these conferences where they, where they, they talk about uh, uh, mutualism, how can mutualism possibly rise in a competitive world? Well, the, the, that's, that's putting the situation backwards. It's, you know, it's how competition arises in a mutualistic world. Because you, uh, you might have uh, you know, foxes and coyotes competing out there, but they couldn't compete were it not for this beautiful harmony within their bodies of mutualisms. So that competition on any one level requires mutualism at the next level down. Centripetality is normatively neutral, since I brought up the, the, question, the question of ethics. Russell obviously put a negative spin on it by calling it imperialism. Uh, our good colleague, Daryl Domning, uh, will probably be talking to us tomorrow about what he calls original selfishness, which I think is a, is a wonderful idea, in, rather than original sin, but anyway. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, 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 the, the autocatalytic orbit, if you will, it's radially directed, and it, it creates a center. It creates a proto-self. It is the embodiment of selfhood in most biological organisms. It was what was keeping that deer alive. Okay. Um, another person who realized this was T.R. de Chardin. He talked about love. Now, okay, we talked about beneficence, which is a proto-form of love, if you I mean. Love is mutual beneficence, after all, uh, and ungiving, canonic. Yeah. But he said that love is a fundamental law of attraction. Uh, St. Bonaventure said that the love among the Trinity is the basis for all action. And both of these men are talking about spiritual things, but they're also talking about centripetality as it exists in the biotic realm. Now, one thing I didn't mention that I have to interject as an aside, okay? Uh, you, you don't get this ratcheting up in autocatalysis unless there's some form of memory, okay? Require, the system has to, have, has to has, has some form of memory in comparing what, what went on the, the cycle before and so forth. And, of course, we say memory, and immediately everybody in the room thinks, oh, DNA and RNA, because that's what we're, that's what we're taught to do, after all. That's the big memory thing. Uh, and I say, no, not necessarily. Remember that these configurations of processes could be stable, and they could serve as a form of memory, if you will, in and of themselves. It's not necessary to have uh, a, a particular material pattern, although it's, you know, it's obvious uh, to in which to put the memory. Um, remember, configurations of processes can be stable 
and they can make structures. The theory, the theory goes now, this is a fellow named Terry Deacon, that um, RNA, the precursor of DNA, RNA and DNA, some people feel that you can't have life until you have DNA. It's called a naked, NI, naked DNA hypothesis for the origin of life. You've got to have that first. I'm not a member of that co community. Some of you may be. Uh, Terry Deacon says that he feels that, that RNA originally was more of an energy carrier and that it was involved in, in, in carrying energy in the proto-organisms uh, proto of early life, but that after a while, an exaptation occurred whereby, whereby uh, uh, the, uh, uh, its, the, the memory of its, of its structure, its linear structure, became more important than its energy function. And it took over. Once it, did, once it took over, it became so efficient that it extirpated everything else. So all we see now is the DNA. Uh, uh, and, but, but, but originally, originally it was, uh, uh, it was configurations of processes. Um, okay, how does autocatalysis evolve over time. I pretty well sketched it out, but let me sort of reiterate a few things. Uh, first of all, it's non-random. The idea here is that you have an autocatalytic structure, and then you have this new event. It's continually being, being flooded with, with, with new events, and most of them, it's just it is, it's just neutral. They just come and they go. No change whatsoever. Every once in a while, an event will, will harm the structure somewhat, and then it has to heal itself and so forth. But every once in a blue moon, every once in a rare time, you'll have a compound event that comes and fits into the autocatalytic scheme. It makes the autocatalytic scheme better. Okay? So it's, it's, it's not random in the sense that not any event is chosen. Very few are chosen. On the other hand, there's, no, there's nothing that says that that event is unique. You know, if we had waited a little bit longer, another one somewhat different but had the same effect, functional effect, could have come in and been frozen into place. We call these frozen contingencies. Could have been, could have been taken into its place so that it's indeterminate. Uh, That's kind of confusing, I agree. So tonight, rather than sending you back to your room to, to think about, you know, why doesn't contingency reign and whatnot, I'd like you to give a little bit of thought to thinking about processes that are non-random but indeterminate. And we'll start off tomorrow uh, with a little example and a little illustration, a little metaphor for uh, non-random but indeterminate processes. I, that would probably be a point to, which I think we can cut for the night, and I hope to see most of you tomorrow morning. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> it wasn't that boring, was it? I, you know, and, you know, my feel, okay, good. My feeling is that uh, I don't believe there is a proof of a God. You know, I think that if there were a proof of a God, uh, we would lose our free will, we would lose our ability to love, we would all become automatons. I mean, if we could actually see God right there, how could you possibly? Okay, so that's a personal, personal belief of my own, okay? Uh, on the other hand, I don't try to, so I don't try to prove. Uh, the only thing that I'm arguing for is that I have encountered any number of individuals uh, who simply laugh at the idea that there is a God. I, I remember seeing this debate between John Hawt, Jack Hawt, and uh, uh, what's his name, Jerry Coyne, K-O-Y-N-E, and so forth, where, where Coyne just belittled 
hot and laughed at him. And he took the, he took the creed and he went down sentence by sentence and kept on laughing and whatnot. Um, the idea is that, that we uh, are rational people and we see rationally that there is no God. And I'm saying, you haven't looked deep enough because you can't prove that there is no God. That, that's, my, that's, my, that's my attack. I don't try to prove there's a God. I try to argue that, you know, if you're so cocksure of yourself, I don't think you've looked at this thing closely enough. And incidentally, most of my, most of my colleagues uh, in all of this
There's, there, I think there's a, there's a whole trend of the other things that we do. The idea that this is a continuing thing. It's not a fixed thing either. Um, and, well, just, I'll, I'll throw in the idea of the community. The idea is that I feel that the interface is not following the system that's in there. The idea that Thank you. 